Hi, my name is Yan, and I'll be talking about our work evaluating self supervised learning via risk decomposition. This is joint work of Tatsu and Percy, and we're all from Stanford. So the setting that we are considering here is self supervised learning for computer vision. In this setting, there are two key components. First, you have to uh, pre train the self supervised learning encoder. To do that, you take some unlabeled images, let's say from ImageNet, you augment them, and then you train or pre-train that enco uh, an encoder to give you some useful representations using self supervised learning. And the key part here is that it doesn't require access to labels. Once you have such pre-trained encoder, you take some uh, labeled, uh, labeled images, let's say again from ImageNet, you encode them using your pre-trained encoder, and you get some representations. And from those representations, you train your linear classifier, also called a linear probe, using supervised learning to predict the task of interest. Here, classifying animals versus fruits. So there are many self-supervised learning pipelines that have been proposed. And they differ, for example, in the self-supervised learning objectives, in the architectures of the encoder, and the optimizers that are being used in the pre-training data. And usually, they are, at least typically, they are evaluated using a single metric, which is linear probing accuracy on ImageNet. The issue of such um, metric is that using a single metric does not provide you uh, any insights into why a self-supervised learning pipeline is better, when or in which settings will such a pipeline be better, and how to improve that pipeline. So in the case of supervised learning, one thing which is useful to at least partially answer some of these questions is to monitor the training and the validation loss. For example, if you see that your training loss is high and your validation loss is low, you know that you're underfitting, and you know that you can Im probably improve your performance by increasing the capacity of your predictor. Um, in the other case, if you're overfitting, then you know that you could regularize your predictor to perform that, uh, better. So this training and the validation losses, they are estimators, at least coarse grain estimators, of what we call the supervised risk decomposition, which is the fact that your risk can be decomposed into your approximation error, which is estimated by your training error, and your generalization error, also called estimation error, which is a difference between your training and your validation error. The issue is that in self-supervised learning, we don't have such losses to monitor. And this is because the self-supervised learning loss that you're optimizing is usually not correlated with your downstream performance. So our idea is very simple. It is to generalize the supervised risk decomposition to self-supervised learning, and then to estimate each of the uh, error components in the self-supervised learning risk decomposition. So as a background and a warm up, uh, let's think about the risk decomposition in the supervised case. In the supervised case, there are typically two constraints that you have to take into account. First, what predictor you're using, like the function family and the constraints on the function family, for example, if you're using linear predictors. And second, the, uh, the errors that come from uh, the fact that you're training that linear classifier on finite data. So the first error component is called the approximation error, and the second, the estimation or generalization gap. And the sum of the two gives you the total risk. So in the case of the self-supervised learning risk decomposition, you have the two same columns of CP4 because you're training with supervised learning um, a linear classifier, the probe. But now you also have three constraints that come from the encoder, the self-supervised learning encoder that you're training. And these three constraints are one, the architectural constraints of your encoder. Two, what algorithm or self-supervised learning algorithm you're using. And three, uh, which pre-training data you're using. So there are errors that come from the fact that you're using finite pre-training data. Any path in this matrix would give you a valid self-supervised learning risk decomposition. We provide and focus on this one because we show in the paper that this is the easiest to estimate. So this gives four uh, different error components. The approximation error, which is errors that come from the, which uh, quantifies errors that come from the architectural constraints. The usability error, which quantifies errors due to the fact that you're using self-supervised learning instead of supervised learning. And uh, self-supervised learning might not ensure that your representations are linearly uh, separable. Then the probe generalization, uh, which, are, which comes from the errors or quantifies the errors that come from the finite uh, training data for your probe. And then the encoder generalization, which uh, quantifies the errors that come from the finite pre-training data for your encoder. And one thing to notice is that the probe generalization and the encoder generalization are actually dependent on your self-supervised learning algorithm. For example, if your self-supervised learning algorithm always uh, gives you an encoder which gives constant representations 
uh, then your probe generalization will be essentially perfect because uh, probes will be able to classify uh, the same on the training data as on the test data because uh, the representations are constant. And we provide also efficient estimators for each of these components. Okay, so now let's jump into the experiments. Um, we have a broad evaluation of self supervised learning methods, uh, specifically 169 pre-training encoders, 28 objectives, 20 architectures, and seven years of algorithms. Uh, and we benchmark all these models on um, linear probing of ImageN in different settings, uh, few and false shot. And we also estimate for each of these models uh, the error components of the self supervised learning risk decomposition. So in terms of results, the first thing we show is that actually there's no model which is uniformly better, uh, at least currently, in all our risk decomposition or risk terms. And this leads to the fact that there's also no model which is uniformly better in every setting that we consider. So typically models are either good in a full shot regime for image net linear classification or in the few shot regimes. And these two are always different in subcategories that we consider um, and across all the models that we consider. So there's a trade-off between uh, full and few shot performance. The second thing that we show is that uh, the two major risk components are the usability and have always been the usability and the probe generalization. Uh, specifically before, usability used to be the main component, but we show that since contrastive learning, uh, this has improved a lot. And now the biggest component is probe generalization, which is actually pretty surprising when you think about it, because probe generalization is simply the generalization of a linear classifier train of the entire Im image net. And still most of the um, errors come from this. We show that encoder generalization is for now, still uh, not that important. Approximation is nearly uh, neglectable. We also show that um, the usability, so let's focus on these two components, which we, which I just said were the most important. We show that usability is essentially what controls how well you will perform in the full shot regime of image data classification. Um, and probe generalization is what controls how well you will perform in the few shot regime. And we show that it's actually a trade-off between uh, usability and probe generalization, which leads to a trade-off into full shot and few shot uh, performance, which we saw before. Uh, then we consider also all the different uh, design choices. And here uh, I give a brief summary. Um, what is important is that there are some design choices, for example, dimensionality, which can control the um, usability and probe generalization trade-off. And as a result, control the full and few shot uh, trade-off. And given this insight, uh, we show that we can decrease, uh, that we can improve performance, for example, in few shot regimes by simply decreasing dimensionality without uh, having to retrain any self supervised learning encoder. So simply um, decreasing the dimensionality and you get huge gains um, in few shot performance. One additional insight that we see is that other design choices um, so for example, the architecture or also the number of epochs or the number of parameters can overcome the trade-off, the, the, this trade-off. And as a result, it can give uniform improvements. Uh, so here we show, for example, that um, when you're using VITs instead of um, convolutional neural networks, you get huge gains, both in the full, uh, full shot, but also in the few shot regimes. And finally, there are some design choices. For example, the exact objective inside of the uh, class of objectives of generative or contrastive uh, losses, the exact objective really doesn't matter once you control um, for all confounders. And this is pretty surprising given that most papers actually typically uh, um, provide a new, a new self surprising loss. So we show that most of the gains are actually due to other architectural or hyperparameters. So in summary, uh, we provide a new self-supervised learning with decomposition, which generalizes the uh, standard uh, supervised one, and we provide efficient estimators for each of, each of the um, terms in the decomposition. We then uh, provide and do a meta-analysis of 169 models and 30 design uh, choices. And it, I just provided a very brief overview of the results, but there are many more in the paper. For example, the thorough analysis of each design choice and also the large scale evaluation of our self supervised learning uh, models um, and all the different metrics and settings. 
And finally, if you just want to use any of these 169 models, want to have access to all the metadata that we collected, uh, or all the results, then you can simply do it in one line using Torch Hub API and our code uh, here, which is linked. Thank you for listening.